Iceland is somewhere we've been talking about for years, but we never really got round to it. Now, with COVID disappearing, the lockdowns stopping and us being able to travel again, it suddenly came up in conversation as somewhere we should look at going. A lot of people will just do a few days in Iceland. Um, some people will do weeks, but we decided on a sort of compromise, a couple of weeks touring around the island uh, in a rented vehicle. I've made another video that shows some images from Iceland, so uh, I'll put details in the description of that. Uh, but I thought I'd make this short video just to talk about some of the things that we found out about traveling to Iceland, um, some advice, uh, because various people had asked us about this. Okay, so enjoy. Iceland, as a quick look at the map will show, has one main sealed road that goes around the outside of the country. The middle is basically desert, covered in dirt roads. More about the dirt roads later. So it seemed to us that there were two real choices of itinerary. We could either just spend a few days touring around the southwest, around Reykjavik, which a lot of people do, or we could splash out on two weeks or so doing the complete circle. I mean, I wouldn't do the circle in less than two weeks having now done it and having planned it. One bonus of doing the full circle is that once you get more than a day's drive from Reykjavik, things get a lot quieter. You're generally away from the hordes of 20-somethings rushing around visiting locations that they've seen on Game of Thrones cash. I took a load out and that was a waste of time. You just don't need it in Iceland. It's a very modern economy. They take card payment for everything. Internet connectivity. All the hotels we stayed in had free Wi-Fi. Obviously on the road you've got big gaps between places so there's going to be places where you can't get a signal. I did check, telephone contract did cover free roaming in Iceland, but it's certainly worth checking before you go. Language, well that's definitely not a problem. Everyone speaks embarrassingly good English. It really does show me up. Safety, well, I think we saw one police officer in about two weeks. I think that's an indication of how safe the island is. Arriving from the UK, passport control at a 45 minute plus queue. So factor this delay in if you're being collected from the airport. If you're an EU citizen, then there are loads of automated passport scanners. So that shouldn't be a problem. Now Reykjavik's a nice little airport. It's conveniently small. However, when you arrive, all the companies that have rental cars, rental campers, will generally send a representative with a van with a clipboard to come and find their customers in the arrivals hall. So it's a bit of a bun fight trying to find the right person. It's definitely worth making sure you've got the telephone number for the rental company so that you can phone them when you inevitably end up later than you expected and they've disappeared. So that brings me on to car rental companies and I've seen this in multiple countries in recent years. It seems the trick nowadays is to offer a low rental price to compete, but then when the customer turns up at the rental desk, frighten them with an estimate of the thousand euros to three thousand euros that they're going to have to pay in excess if they so much as scratch the car. And then of course offer fairly expensive insurance that will remove that excess. An alternative option that I've used in a number of countries is to take out a separate policy that covers your excess. Now this probably isn't for everyone. It adds complexity and it means that if you do damage the vehicle, you will have to pay the rental car company when you return it, but then you can go back home and claim the excess back. Now a caveat there is that I have never had to claim an excess back, so I can't tell you quite how well it works. But certainly from a cost perspective, it's a fraction of the cost of paying for the extra insurance from the actual rental company. 
The next question, if you decide to take out one of these policies, is what does it cover? Iceland is particularly difficult in this sense because there are a lot of dirt roads, there's a possibility of damage from volcanoes, however small, there's a much, much higher possibility of having stone chips caused by gravel being thrown up. So you need to be sure that any insurance is going to cover that or you're going to be paying out of your pocket for it. Now, when I looked at a number of these insurance policies, I found one that did in fact cover all the things that an Icelandic car rental company will sell you additional insurance for. Now I imagine a lot of people if they're travelling on holiday would like to have a nice shiny car and certainly in many places when I've turned up at a big brand rental agency that's what I've got sometimes with delivery mileage on the clock. Of course the downside of this is if you're actually going to be using that car for a couple of weeks there is a fair chance you're going to end up with some sort of scratch or stone chip on it and it's going to show up on a brand new car. So my preference is to find a car that's a bit older. Now choice of car types is probably more important in Iceland than it is in many other places and that's because of the aforementioned dirt roads. These are the F roads, they have an F prefix on their numbering and they're highland roads, they cover the centre of the country. If you want to drive on those you have to have a four-wheel drive. Your insurance will not cover you for any damage if you do not have a four-wheel drive. And by the way, even if you have a four-wheel drive, if you drive it through a river, and there are quite a number of river crossings, any damage to the car caused by water is not covered. You could end up writing off an engine. And that means you could end up paying for an engine yourself on a brand new vehicle. Accommodation. This is a trip that we booked 100% ourselves, so we weren't going to a travel agent. That meant that because we were moving on almost every day, there was quite a lot of accommodation we had to book. In the end, apart from one or two places which I booked with points, everywhere else was booked through bookings.com. Obviously there are other bookings agencies you can use that will undoubtedly be just as good. Also, when booking accommodation abroad, I'm used to there being a whole different range of rooms, all with ensuite facilities, from sort of very budget rooms up to very expensive rooms. Now in Iceland, there seemed to be quite a dividing line. There was plenty of accommodation if you didn't want ensuite or you wanted more backpacker style accommodation. But if we wanted to have our own bathroom, then that pretty much limited us. And really we found in September, it was difficult to get anything below about 120 pounds per night with a bathroom. And it was going up to about 180. We also made sure each hotel had breakfast, car parking and free Wi-Fi. Now an increasingly popular, and I suppose cheaper alternative, is to camp. Now we've got a camper van at home, so we do quite a lot of camping here and abroad, but we decided in this case that we'd rather pay for hotel accommodation, especially given that Iceland does seem to be quite a wet country. Now food isn't really something you think about as being a problem when you travel, but one of the things with Iceland is that food was very expensive, either in restaurants or just from the supermarket. We were very frugal during our trip, but it still cost us quite a lot of money. We rarely ate at restaurants. We found one of the biggest supermarket chains, Bonus, those are the guys with the big pink piggy bank logo, and we bought a lot of food there, but that was still expensive. Alcohol is also very expensive, everyone's heard that but I wasn't really expecting the fact that the supermarkets just don't sell it. So you have to go to specialist government license, off licenses to buy it. I probably had one or two beers during the whole two week trip. One thing we did learn quite late on in the trip was that petrol stations often have diners attached to them and they're often quite good and they'll do reasonable food at a reasonable price. But the two big things we did to save money on food was made sure that every hotel we booked had a decent free breakfast so we could pretty much load ourselves up with food in the mornings and use that as our main meal because the price of having an inclusive breakfast is pretty cheap in comparison to the price of having an evening meal for the same number of calories. We also used the supermarket to buy quite a lot of snacks and various other bits of food that we could use during the trip. Some cases we just heat up soup and have that instead. Parking. Now, according to friends, 
this is pretty much a new thing in Iceland. Not parking per se, but having to pay for parking. Now some places will have parking machines. Other places though may rely on a parking app. So there is a parking app called Parka, P-A-R-K-A. -A. We did use that. You put in the rental car details, you put in your credit card details, and you can supposedly pay for parking. But it was a bit hit and miss. It did work in some places, but other places we had some real problems with it. Some of these car parks have camera systems, so they'll take your registration number. The car hire company take details of our credit card so that they could pass on any parking fines. I would consider spotting if it's camera based before you actually get up to the cameras and deciding if you want to go there. And if you do, maybe try and play with the Parker app before you drive through the cameras. Because otherwise you could be in the situation where it's got your registration details and then you struggle to pay for parking. Things to see and activities. We didn't spend much time in Reykjavik but then we tend to be wilderness people. Activities are expensive though, so we decided on a limited number that we thought would be special, and we weren't disappointed. We snorkeled at Thingvellir, the intercontinental spreading zone. It's resulted in a canyon that you can snorkel down. The water is crystal clear. It's about freezing, but they give you all the right gear. But all the right gear does mean that it takes quite a long time to get ready, so you've got to allow pretty much half a day for the activity. Another thing we did, which can cost a few pounds, we visited a spa. Now a lot of people will visit the hot spas at the Blue Lagoon, which is near Keflavik. But since we were touring the entire island, we decided to leave it until we got to the Myvatn region in the north of the country. And there, there's a really nice set of nature baths, they call them, which is slightly up on the hill. So you can sit there in the hot water, looking out over the lake. You can also get a ticket which allows you to buy drinks from the Swim Up Bar, but we, we didn't bother with that, that just adds even more cost. Now we do quite a lot of kayaking at home, so this was something we were quite keen to have a go at in Iceland. And you can do these sort of glacial lake kayaking experiences. The real go-to one is at Jokulsala, which is the big, almost circular lake full of icebergs, very spectacular but it's a very touristy experience there's a lot of amphibious vehicles boats etc out on the water so we decided not to kayak that one we just go and see it on foot and instead we booked a kayaking experience at a much smaller glacial lake and that was fantastic it was only our small party and we literally did have to break the ice on the lake to get the kayaks out onto it Although that was early September, that was pretty much the last kayaking activity they were going to do before the lake was too frozen that you couldn't kayak on it. It also included a walk on one of the icebergs, so all the boats would be moored on an iceberg. We put on ice spikes and climb up onto the iceberg, so that was a really nice extra treat there. Now one of the really beautiful places to see is Stock Ness on the southeast of the island. It's a spit of land with a black sand beach with mountains tearing up into the sky behind. It's really spectacular. They have a cafe there, which is actually really quite a good cafe. And surprisingly, the cafe have got several rooms behind that you can rent. Uh, we rented one of those rooms for two nights, which is probably more than most people rent for. And for such a, a remote location, it was pretty good. It was an ensuite room with heating, with, uh, I think it had Wi-Fi as well. And the price of renting the room included the ticket price for getting through the barrier to the beach. And you got to do that in order to get the fantastic views. They do charge you even if you walk. It's private land, so there's not an option of just dumping the car in their car park, sneaking around and walking. They are keeping an eye out for people trying to do that. They do also allow you to camp overnight in their car park. When it comes to booking activities or experiences, I would seek out the actual company running the event. So for example, for the snorkeling, I did some research, found the main company that runs diving and snorkeling, and we booked directly with them. Of course, it wouldn't be Iceland without waterfalls. So, here are a few of them.
hopefully that's given you some things to think about. So if you are planning a trip to Iceland, have a fantastic time from the both of us. Okay, bye guys.